It's the book club for kids. 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 It's the book club for kids podcast. Hi, I'm Kitty Feldy. This week, we bring you a show that we recorded remotely with students from Fulton County, Georgia. The book is Not Your All-American Girl by Wendy Wanlong Shang and Madeline Rosenberg. So what does an American look like? Tara looks like she's from Pleasant Valley. She meant, you look like you're from someplace else. Some place that isn't Pleasant Valley. Some place that isn't even in the United States. That's our celebrity reader, comedian Becca Nix Tam. Our readers discuss the state of race relations in 21st century America. I thought that America has gone through a lot of segregation and discrimination problems, so I thought that by now, people would learn to uh, at least learn from their mistakes. I guess they still don't get it. And our writers went to great lengths to do the research for the book, including tuning up their hula hoop skills. Wendy found a hula hoop teacher in Australia (laughs) who gave us hula hoop lessons over Zoom. Over Zoom. This is the Book Club for Kids, the show where kids talk about books. We'll tell you how you can be on the show a little bit later on, but first, let's meet our readers. Hi, my name is Krippa. Hello, my name is Sadie. Hi, my name is Anna. Hi, my name is Sophie. My name is Durga. Hi, my name is Hannah. Hi, my name is Aditi, and we're all from Fulton County School in Atlanta, Georgia. The book is about a girl named Lauren who has always been friends with her friend Tara, and then they don't have any classes together in sixth grade. So their solution is to try out for the school play, and Lauren is really great at singing, and she hopes that for once she'll get the lead. But Tara gets it just because Lauren doesn't look like your average American girl, so she wouldn't look the part. And then everything just starts to crumble. Well, let's hear that scene from the book. Our celebrity reader is comedian Becca Nix-Tam. Tara said, Mrs. Tyndall, we just checked the lists, and we wondered if Lauren was supposed to be on the callback list. She had a really good audition, didn't she? Lauren did have a good audition. That's why she's been cast, said Mrs. Tyndall. She smiled, and I couldn't tell if she was acting. You also had a good audition. Thanks, Tara said. We just wondered, Mrs. Tyndall didn't know about the royal we, if Lauren was supposed to get a callback for Brenda Sue, too. I wanted to hug Tara, but Mrs. Tyndall didn't look like she wanted to hug anybody. She sighed and took off her glasses. You definitely have some musical talent, she said to me, but I have to consider the audience. You don't want the audience to be taken out of the story for any reason. The audience comes to the theater for 90 minutes of magic, right? We nodded. So when we go to the town of Pleasant Valley, Tennessee, We want to see it on stage, an all-American town trying to do what's right for its young people. Something inside me started to feel like one of those dreams where you begin to fall and keep falling. I have a second cousin in Tennessee, I said, though I knew that that was not the point. Look at Tara, said Mrs. Tyndall. When people see her, they won't have a hard time imagining she's an all-American girl from Pleasant Valley. It's our job in the theater to make it easy for the audience to try to imagine they are right there with her. She made it sound so reasonable. She said, Tara looks like she's from Pleasant Valley. She meant, you look like you're from someplace else, someplace that isn't Pleasant Valley. Some place that isn't even in the United States. Why hadn't I sung the Star Spangled Banner for my tryout instead? Our main character complains about being a side dish and her best friend as the main course. What is she talking about? So 
by side dish, she means like, so if you're taking your lunch, then the peanut butter and jelly sandwich is like the star of your lunch. And then she's like a side dish, like an apple. So she still is important, but they need、um, each other to have a complete friendship. A complete lunch, but she is just like a minor role, while Tara always gets the major role. So, are you a side dish or a main course? Do you think? I might be in the middle. I'm not too popular, but I have like a lot of friends, some very strong friends that I've known for a long time. I would say that I'm maybe a little bit of both because when I'm with my friends. Maybe one of them will be talking, and everyone else will be paying attention to them. And sometimes they'll be paying attention to me. I'd say I'm again probably a little bit of both. And like, if you're saying still using like the food analogy, I'd probably be like the macaroni and cheese. It can be either depending on what you have it with. I would probably be something like a fruit, because sometimes you like the fruit a bit more than the like entree, but it's. Like considered a side dish. I think I would consider myself maybe just something spicy, like spicy and sweet, because sometimes I can be really like loud and like outspoken, and sometimes I can just be quiet. Let's talk a little bit about one of the、um, interesting talents that Lauren has, and that is she has a button maker machine. Um, well, Lauren has this button machine because before she used to buy a lot of buttons, and she makes all kinds of different buttons depending on the situation, and she does it on a daily basis, which I think is really cool. I would really like to have a button machine like Lauren's because I really like all the buttons she makes, and I want to make stuff like that. Now we're not talking about buttons that keep your、uh, blouse shut, are we? No, it's not like the button you would have on like a shirt to keep it from opening up. It's like the kind that are basically like little pins that you can put on your shirt, and they have like fun words or patterns or pictures. This book is not set present day, is it? No, this book is not set present day because even though the play is set in 1956 that they're doing in the book. The book is actually set in like between the seventies and the eighties, and if you pay close attention to the book, you can tell because like they have Walkmans, they like listen to a bunch of CDs and cassette tapes, and la- they use landline phones. So it's the little details that let you know that it is not present day. Was there any technology that puzzled you guys that you had no idea what they were talking about? One of the pieces of technology that kind of confused me was a Walkman. And how did you find out what the heck it was? Uh, because in the book it said that she played music on her Walkman, so I guess it was kind of just like an old-fashioned version of like an iPod or something. So the book is called "Not Your All American Girl." What is an American all American girl to you guys? Well, an all American girl、uh, has good traits. Like she is very loyal to her country, America, and she has pride for America, despite some of its flaws. And America is a country that welcomes people from all different places in the world. So it's like where they all. Um, meet up together, so it's a place where you can make friends and learn a lot of new things. The book talks about the places that America falls short, also when it comes to how we treat all people and the way that we perceive what Americans should look like. I mean, what's an all-American girl to you guys? To me, an all-American girl is someone who has pride in their country. And supports them even if the country makes some bad choices. An all-American girl, I think, would be like pride. As everyone said, they would have pride in their country, but they would also be welcoming to anyone else who wanted to make America their country. In the book, Lauren faces、um, some discrimination by the drama teacher for not looking like the way the drama teacher thinks an all-American girl looks like. 
Now, nobody can see you guys, but you guys are a very multicultural group of kids. Have you ever experienced adults mis- or even kids misperceptions that you guys don't look the way, you know, that you guys look like other rather than the all-American girl? I'm not really sure if this counts or not, but sometimes people think that I'm from a different race, like Korean or Japanese. And you're not. What are you? Chinese. And how does that make you feel? Well, it kind of like annoys me that I have to explain to them that I'm Chinese. And why do you think people just make that assumption? Maybe because I'm Asian and a lot of Asian people look very similar. I do want to talk a little bit about the Asian attack that uh, Lauren picks up the torch, as we could say, I guess, and tries to become an advocate. I think the guy's name was Vincent Chin. Well, um, it was near his wedding day, and he was just um, in, like, the store or pub, I think. He was at some sort of place where a lot of people were. And these two guys, I think they might have recently lost their job or getting afraid they might lose their job. They thought he was Japanese because he was actually Chinese. But... They thought that he was Japanese, and since Japan was getting all those cars out and they were losing their jobs, they got angry. So um, when they all got kicked out of that store or whatever, um, they tracked Vincent Chin, and um, they attacked him. And one of them held him down while the other beat him up, and they ended up burying him on his wedding day. I think they said that they took it to court and they said the court was like thought it was like reasonable so they didn't pay much attention to it so that was like a murder so I don't know why would they like just let it go like that. The first time I read it I was actually kind of surprised that it happened because I never heard about how everyone was getting angry at people they thought was Japanese. And so that kind of surprised me the first time I read about it, and I thought it was really unfair. I think the reason just makes no sense and that it's really unfair because, I mean, car manufacturing isn't like a thing to get super duper upset about. Well, you guys know that there have been hate crimes going on, maybe not this serious, but going on all the time now with um, people who are Asian being attacked because when COVID began, they called it the Chinese flu or the Asian flu, so... Um, does it surprise you that such violence goes on even today? It does surprise me because, like, we learn about it in school all the time, and sometimes it's on, like, public news, and everyone's always against it, or they say that, but then, like, when something like COVID happens, they just, like, let, like, let loose. I am very surprised about this because, uh, I thought that America has gone through a lot of segregation and discrimination problems. So I thought that by now, people would learn to uh, at least learn from their mistakes. I guess they still don't get it. Well said. Well, what do you think will make them get it? I think since um, most people who kind of get involved in this kind of thing don't know how it feels to be the target of it or have to be put in the same situation... So I think if they just got like a small taste of how other people feel, um, like I'm not saying they should, but like maybe if they did kind of have to go to that, they might understand how that was completely unfair. I know you guys have some questions for our writers. Who wants to start? Usually there's um, not two authors, so I wonder how um, both of the authors were working together to make the book. We write a very detailed outline. <laughs> then we throw it away. <laughs> we did do that. <laughs> we, we, um, I was going to say very carefully. Yeah. Thoughtfully. <laughs> when I um, describe the way we write to people, it's easier if you could see my hands making this little step-by-step visual thing. And but let me just can't. describe it. It looks like two sharks that are <laughs> swimming side-by-side side in the ocean. <laughs> but, you know, one of us will write and get to a certain point, 
the other of us will edit all of that and then move ahead a little bit. Then the next one will edit all of that and move ahead a little bit. So we're moving ahead very, very slowly. Is the story about Vincent Chin true? The story of Vincent Chin is definitely true. Um, it, it's not one that I had heard growing up, but it's one that Wendy mm -hmm. did grow up hearing about. Although, like Lauren, it was years after the fact. You guys, um, it says that you took some of your own experiences and kept them into the book. Yeah, I mean, I think there's always something of us in every character that mm -hmm. we write. And for this book, we tried very hard to make it, you know, a blend. I think um, Lauren's desperate desire not to be in conflict with her best friend mm -hmm. was very much me. <laughs> and But then also realizing there's a, there's a price to pay for that. Um, you know, some of the holiday things are in there. There's a little bit of my grandmother and the grandmothers. I think there's some of Wendy and the mom and some of your mom and the mom. Yes, some of my mom and the mom because the mom uh, decides she wants to go back to school, which is what my mom did when I was around Lauren's age. And some of me, sure. I mean, I think that moment where she finds out about Vincent Shin and realizes that she's connected to a much bigger thing than she realizes, and it puts her life in a different perspective, is also very much me. Yeah. I think some of the trying to find yourself and find that connection to somebody mm -hmm. that reflects you was a little bit of both of us, because I was always like, you know, if you told me somebody was Jewish growing up, mm -hmm. you know, like... Anytime I saw somebody say Happy Hanukkah, I was like, woohoo! <laughs> you know? um, where did you get the button making idea from? Because it adds a lot to the story and it's one of my favorite things about it. Oh, I was like totally into buttons in the 80s because in lieu of having snappy things to say, one could just have a snappy button and have that taken care of for you. So. I very much associate, I mean, I remember going, you know, there are, there are certain stores at the mall and you go in there, just be a big bowl of buttons and you would just kind of paw through it looking for that one that just best represented your personality. Yeah, and we had um, gotten, when my kids were small, one of those button making kits and they never worked as well as you wanted them to. There was always <laughs> a little bit of the plastic kind of peeling off and mm. stuff like that. But, um, you know, we, we made a lot with them. I would ask if one of you authors actually had your grandmas live with you. My grandmother lived with us for a very brief time when I was about 14. My grandfather had passed away and she came from Taiwan to live with us in the United States for maybe six months. And boy, was I a little jerk about it. And I feel like that's part of the reason why I have grandparents in my story sometimes is because I want to make up for that. Like I want to be like, okay, now that's not how you behave. This is how you should, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a treasure. No, not me. I had one grandmother died when I was 12 mm -hmm. and the, that was the one I got along with the best. One grandmother who was sort of the quintessential Jewish grandmother did not live with us. I did not get along with her exceptionally well but she was such a character and, um, <laughs> so I will say that she gets into my stories a little bit. The hard part with the grandmothers in these books is they, they threaten to take over every scene they are in. It's like sometimes we really have to put a net over them and tell them to settle down. We do and we have a friend who had suggested that we write a story where you know, just focused on, <laughs> mostly focused on the grandmothers. And I, I still really want to, want to go there. <laughs> and I'd also ask if you guys were good at hula hooping. <laughs> one, one of us is. <laughs> and that would not be me. So, Wait. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so when we were working on this, um, Wendy, it was pandemic and we were looking for things to do because... As you all know, there was not a lot to do. And Wendy found a hula hoop teacher in Australia <laughs> who gave us hula hoop lessons over Zoom. Over Zoom. She actually came up with a routine for us. Yes. 
But I know I can't hold. I could not hula hoop to save my life, and she actually got me to hula hoop for yeah, a respectable we, amount of time. Yes, Wendy did. But but Madeline well. could hula hoop like in a hurricane. Sometimes it depends. It depends on the hoop, actually. Oh yes, that's what we you discovered. Know, the yes. hoop quality varies quite a bit. It does. You need something weighted. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. So if you're just learning to hula hoop, a nice weighted hoop of I the mean, correct of the correct diameter. Yeah. Um, could help you a lot, so don't don't get discouraged and give up. Because... And don't get the cheap little grocery store one, unless right. you are an actual child. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask you guys the hardest question in the entire world, which is, what is your favorite book, and why do you love it? I actually have two favorite books. I like Fuzzy Mud by Lewis Thatcher. It's really engaging, and I also like The Night Diary, and I absolutely love that book. I actually like it better than Fuzzy Mud, so yeah, they're both really good. And we should mention that The Night Diary is one of our Book Club for Kids episodes, and if you want to hear that one, you just go to the website, bookclubforkids.org. I really like the books written by Rob Buyo. Oh, yeah. We just did um, Because of Mr. Tarrup, which was a wonderful book. Which ones do you like? We also did read Because of Mr. Tarrup, but I am in the process of reading The Perfect Score. And I really like the books because they're from all the characters' different point of views. If I could recommend series, I'd probably say Wings of Fire or Warriors, and also probably throw Land of Stories in there because they're just really engaging and I like fantasy. So one of the series that I love, um, it's called Five Kingdoms. It's basically about, it's fantasy, but it's it has elements that make it like, that show that it's also like real, like the characters have like internal conflicts. And another book series that I like, I feel like this is like, I feel like a lot of people like this book series. I love the Harry Potter. So what's your other favorite series? Uh, it's actually a book. It's called The Unteachables. I think it's because you get to really like know how everyone feels as they solve the problem. Escape from Mr. Lomoncello's Library is the first book in the series and I really like it because it introduced me to the author Chris Rabstein and I really like his books because all his books they're funny they have a good amount of fantasy but they're also realistic fiction at the same time and then they also have just like a little dash of mystery sprinkled in like in Escape from Mr. Lamentello's library they have to figure out how to escape from the library. I really like the book Wonder. I like how it gives like not only the main character August's perspective, but it gives like well, like most of the characters' perspectives. I really like books about kids like August that have to go through harder times than many of us, and it helps me learn a lot of how I can help people like these. And Wonder is another of our Book Club for Kids podcast episodes. So again, you can just go to the website for a link, bookclubforkids.org. Durga, we haven't heard from you. What's your favorite book? The Raw Booyah books. I love them because they talk from like all the characters' different perspectives. What about you, Wendy and Madeline? What are your favorite books? One of my favorite books, and I'll be honest, this is an answer that changes frequently, but one of my regular favorites is Harriet the Spy by Louise Fitzhugh. And I think the reason why that book sticks with me is because I spent a lot of my childhood trying to be good and for a long time reading books about how to be good. And Harriet the Spy was one of the first books I read where she was clearly not good and yet she was the hero of the story and she got into trouble and she had adventures and she was still loved. And I think that was a really important message for me to get. I have a really hard time narrowing down my favorite book, but what I often tell people is that it's The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Jester. And the reason that I've always loved that book is because it's the first book that I read that really taught me how to play with words. Okay, Becca Nixdam, got a favorite book? 
My favorite book of all time is The Missing Piece by Shel Silverstein. It's a book about growing to love yourself for who you are, regardless of who you think you should be, whether you think you should be a part of a pair of uh, people or a group of people. The best you is the you that you can grow with yourself and grow to love. And uh, it's a really good book. I don't want to spoil the end of it, um, but it, it does really show that um, you can just be yourself uh, without having to be what other people expect you to be. We'll have a list of everybody's favorite book at our website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you have a favorite book, you can be on the Book Club for Kids podcast too. Just send us an email and we'll send you all the information. The email is kitty at bookclubforkids.org. Thanks this week to our producer, Chad Francis. Brandon Baker composed our theme with additional music from Charles Nilman. Emma Steinkellner designed our logo. Thanks this week to our writers, Wendy Wan Long Shang and Madeline Rosenberg, and our celebrity reader, Becca Nixtan. And thanks to our readers from the Fulton County Schools in Georgia and their media and educational technology instructor, Amy Rubin. Now, if you're looking for a way to get a child to pick up a book this summer, sign up for our newsletter. Every other week, we will send you a reading tip designed to turn reluctant readers into lifelong book lovers. You can do that at the website, bookclubforkids.org. And if you're looking for a little adventure in your life, check out the Fina Mendoza Mysteries podcast. The series is set on Capitol Hill and is designed to introduce civics education to young listeners. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for listening.